Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever struggled with money or felt you lived in a money fog, then do we have the Rewire for Wealth show for you. Today I'll be talking with Barbara Houston, formerly Barbara Stanny, best-selling author, financial therapist, teacher, and wealth coach, about her seventh and perhaps greatest book on financial success, Rewire for Wealth. And that's just what I want to talk with her about today, about three steps you can take to reprogram your brain for financial success. That plus we'll talk about entering caves, recalling risks, red crayons and stretching, a four-year-old and brushing teeth, the power of self-efficacy, what on earth is the other serenity prayer, and what in the world pathologically twisted thoughts have to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Barbara. Are you ready to shine? Oh, yes. I, I, that was a great introduction. That was great. Thank you. Woohoo! So before we dive right into things, Barbara, please forgive me for asking. Your dad was the R in H&R Block, but did you grow up with any understanding of money? You know, every time I would ask my father any question about money, he always gave me the same answer, and that was, don't worry, which I absolutely thought was the best advice he could ever give me, because I didn't understand money, I didn't care about money, I just wanted to spend it. And it turned out, I mean, under those words was the unspoken assumption, there'll always be a man to take care of you, and that was fine with me too. And I married a man who was a stockbroker. So he was perfect. But I found out early in our marriage, he was a compulsive gambler. And over the course of our 15 year marriage, he continued to gamble the money away. And I continued to let him because that's how intimidated I was and terrified about anything financial. And finally, after our divorce, I decided money is not my thing. I do not want to deal with money. Well, I had this theory that if you don't deal with your money, your money will deal with you. And in the next year, I got tax bills for way over a million dollars. And I didn't have a million dollars, not even close to it. My ex had left the country. My father wouldn't lend it to me, bless his heart. And that's when I knew I had to get smart. I like what you just said right there. Not the part of the million dollars, although you and I both know it's all a gift. It's all a cosmic setup. It's all helping us on our path. But you said, my dad wouldn't help, bless his heart. Because this started you, forced you down a very special sacred path, didn't it? Oh, I have thanked my ex-husband and I have thanked my father many times for gambling my money away, for not lending me the money. You and I would not be talking today if those things didn't happen. So going from there, we've got to talk about love and fear. How did you come to find A Course in Miracles? And I believe you were in, what, a a shopping cart at a register or something. And it kind of fell out of the sky. It did fell out of the sky. So when I was going through my deepest and darkest time with money, when I was terrified, and I was still married to the gambler who was still gambling it away, We had just moved to Tiburon, California, Mm -hmm. and I was standing in line at a grocery store. And all of a sudden, I hear someone say, A Course in Miracles. I I didn't know what A Course in Miracles was, but it got my attention. And I leaned back because the people were the behind the people behind me. And I said, What's A Course in Miracles? And she said, It's a book. I don't really know what it is. But she told me where it was being published because then it was just being published in a person's house, which was about two blocks from my home. Of course. So I went to the house. I bought The Course of Miracles. And that that's what I I have always wanted to communicate, that I believe that, that financial success is not just a practical process, but it's also for me and the people I work with a spiritual practice. And, and the, the principles of the Course of Miracles has, have guided me this whole time for the past 35, 40 years. I love that you say it's also a spiritual practice 
Because you and I both know that one of the many limiting beliefs that the majority of us have who are spiritual, who struggle with money, is that I can't focus on money. I'm spiritual. And just like you at four years old, I think you got an an up and coming when you asked your mom about money. That's what's in our consciousness if we say we're spiritual and then we throw out the term wealth. What? See, what, what, did, what did they say? that it, it, the, It's the root of all evil? No. The root of all evil is the lack of love or the lack of self-love. Yeah. Money is nothing. Money, money can't shoot a gun and it can't bandage a wound. Yeah. Money is nothing. It is what we do with it. When I got that million dollars in tax bills and I didn't have it and my father wouldn't lend me the money and I was freaking out, I had three daughters. One was just a baby. Yeah. I was determined not to raise those girls on the street and I didn't know how I was going to do it. But I believe when you make a commitment a down, to, down to your toes, no back door, no holds barred commitment, the universe revolves to help you reach your goal. And I was a journalist writing for the San Francisco Business Times, and I was hired for a freelance project to interview women who were smart with money. And those interviews changed my life. I not only got smart about money, but that's when I wrote my first book, Prince Charming Isn't Coming, and suddenly I had this whole new career. But the damnedest thing, I had this whole new career, and I was traveling all over the country, and I was never home, but I couldn't make money. So I decided I'm going to interview women who make lots of money. And I started making six figures before I even finished writing my next book, Secrets of Six Figure Women. Thank you. So what's interesting is you talk about in the book how people continuously call you like financial advisors. And they say, I can make others oodles and oodles. That's a technical term. Oodles and oodles of money. But for myself, I'm still stuck. And it sounds like you had that plateau as well of, uh, we'll call it, as you do in the book, under-earning. Under-earning is one plateau. The other is not knowing how to manage it. Like so many of these very successful women are making lots of money, but they have nothing to show for it. So many financial professionals call me and say, look, I do this for a living, but my own finances are a mess. There was an epiphany that finally came to you with a piece of mail of neuroscience that was the missing piece in your life, the aha moment about how men and women see money differently. And after that, you could step through the door. Well, yes, I actually stepped through the door before that. Because I got, I knew that it wasn't so much what these women did. It was how they thought. And when they shifted their thinking, everything changed. But there was still a lot, a big time lapse between when they started working on their mindset and when they got the goals they desired. And I knew something was missing. And that's when an article on neuroscience showed up. And that's when I incorporated neuroscience into my work. And that's when I saw I could really expedite women's learning curve and even more expedite their overcoming their resistance. They understood how to train their mind to rewire their brain. All behavior, all our behavior, spending and saving and investing and giving, it's all controlled by our brain. And it, it trying to go against a hardwired neural pathway is like going against gravity. It's just like, holy moly, it's so almost impossible. I love the neuroscience that you put in this book. And as I was reading the book, uh, I'll pop the name of a dear, dear friend of mine because I'm, a, I'm a, uh, an amateur neuroscience geek. And so Dr. Michael Merzenich popped up and I had to shoot him an email and say, hi, Mike, how are you doing? The father of brain plasticity. And he's doing well in Northern California, hunker down right now. So, so. Um, you to- oh, my God. You told him about my book? Of course. <laughs> oh, my God. He's like a. 
he's like an idol of mine. Oh my gosh. He 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 is the coolest. And we've had many discussions about why things like the crack in the sidewalk is actually the greatest gift in the world. Resistance is actually what sharpens the mind. And and we're gonna dive into resistance here. But before we do that, you talk about the foolish habit we have to kick of worrying of not having enough. What can you tell us about this? Well, we all have these stories about money. And for some, it's there's never enough. For others, it's I'm not enough. For others, it's uh, life is tough. It's a struggle. And so much of this has come from the way we were raised and what we saw. And these beliefs have become hardwired in our brain. And our brain has what's called confirmation bias, where we will only see and we will only do what confirms our beliefs. So it's very important to rewire, reprogram those beliefs so that we can easily create that which we have been resisting. Thank you. And confirmation bias is, for those who are not familiar, first off, it's the challenge we have on Google, but it's why you can go in the fridge and know that you have no uh, almond milk, for instance, and you will not find the almond milk. So the dollars may be hidden in plain sight, but if you don't believe you're capable of making them, saving them, or growing them, you're not going to find them. So I'm curious, what's the first step in what I'm going to call Jedi money mind training? Jedi, why do you call it Jedi? Because a Jedi to me, we could call it Samurai. It's kind of the modern version with Star Wars of Samurai, is somebody who will go in on the inside, get still, put out a mirror, look at themselves, and be willing to do the deep dive in the inside and understand cause and effect. Okay, so this this may not be the deepest, deepest dive, these three, but the three steps, I like that, the Jedi approach to wealth building. Okay, Jedi approach to wealth building. So after years of working with this and experimenting and modifying, I boiled it down to three steps yes. that we can use to rewire our brain. Now these three steps are so simple and yet so difficult. Because it, it takes concerted, consistent effort at the beginning of applying these steps. But it, then it gets easier. And then it gets easier. And then it's like a no-brainer. No-brainer. Haha. <laughs> so let me get, tell you the three steps and then explain them. And then I can ap- apply them to an example if you want. Perfect. So the three steps are recognize, mm-hmm. reframe, mm-hmm and respond differently. So recognize, that is start recognizing anytime you have a negative thought, a negative thought, recognize, I'm having a negative thought. Observe it like like an objective bystander, but observe it with curiosity, with curiosity and not with criticism and not with judgment. Oh, isn't it interesting? I'm having a thought about not having enough or I'm having a thought about not being enough. Isn't that interesting? Because it's only a thought, it's not the truth. It's just a thought that we've probably been habitually thinking. Isn't that interesting? I'm having a negative thought about not having enough or not being enough. So that separates you from your thoughts. And then the second step is rewire. Find a way to see it differently because our perception creates our reality. And this is all from A Course of Miracles. There is a lesson in The Course of Miracles that I use as a prayer that I use every time I want to reframe. And that is, above all, let me see this differently. Let me see this differently. So you reframe it. And I'm not enough, maybe, oh, there's enough, there's plenty, whatever that reframe is for you. And it could just be, oh, I'm having a thought about there not being enough. Let me use this to rewire my brain. And then the third step is respond differently, which means you must do what you don't want to do, 
which you don't think you can do, which doesn't feel comfortable. And you just keep doing it. So when you walk by those pair of Prada shoes and you go, I got to have them, notice, recognize that you're having a thought about spending, that you have to have it. It's not the truth. You're just, isn't that interesting? I'm having a thought that I have to have that. And you can reframe it. Oh, this is a chance to rewire. Or I don't really need those shoes. And then respond differently, like, walking by and not buying them or whatever that may be or talking to the sales lady and coming up oh maybe put those aside and give me a day to come back and decide whatever it is but respond differently than you normally would you do those three steps over and over again recognize reframe and respond differently over and over and over again and eventually it just becomes easier Excellent. So I'm going to dive more into recognize, reframe, and respond. Before we do that, I want to talk about three silly basic rules. Silly simple. They're super powerful. Silly simple super. How's that? That can radically change our lives if we understand them. And they have to do with recognize, reframe, and respond. The first one is spend less. And when you talk about recognize, I love that you suggest the importance of tracking our spending. What what you're talking about are the rules of wealth building. There's four rules to wealth building. It's very simple. Building wealth is kind of like losing weight. We all know how to do it, but there's a billion dollar industry out there to help us lose weight. It's the same with, with finances, financial success. So the only thing you have to do is spend less, save more, invest wisely, and give generously in that order. So the first rule which you go is spend less. Mm -hmm. Spend less than you need. And one of the most powerful exercises I have used on me and with clients is really writing down what you spend. Every penny, just write it down at the point of purchase. And this is far more than just about writing down what you spend. It is a whole consciousness raising exercise. It lets you see if you're spending according to your values. If if you're living the life the way you want to live. So spending less means writing down what you spend. Did you want to do anything else with that? Well, what I like about that, no, what I like about that, though, is, is you say it's a consciousness building exercise, because really what you're doing here is, uh, forgive me, monkey, you're putting a monkey in the wheel. You're waking us up. You're taking us out of, as you call it, a money fog and making us more awake and aware of what we're doing with our money. And once you do that, then you can Tai Chi it. Then you can transform it, because if you're asleep at the wheel... There's nothing you can do with it, and it goes away. Right. I mean, I, I, I'll give you the example I use in the book with my own life. So years ago, when I was going through this horrendous period with my money, I went to this money uh, financial recovery coach who, who's a pioneer in the whole field of financial recovery. And she was the one who told me to write down what I spent. And I wouldn't do it. And every week I'd go back, and I didn't do it. And I realize now why I didn't do it. I realized later because it's so freaking powerful writing when I went. And so I started writing down what I was spending finally. And what I noticed is I was spending a fortune on face creams and they weren't even working. <laughs> and my, and, and Karen McCall, the, the, the coach said to me, you know, you can never get enough of what you don't really need. And what I needed was not face creams. What I needed was to feel better about myself. And then she noticed that while I was when I was writing things down, that I wasn't I, that I kept looking through a magnify. I had a magnifying glass because I couldn't read. And she said, "Why don't you get glasses?" And I said, "Because they're so damn expensive." <laughs> and she said, "Here you are." depriving yourself of what you really need, Mm -hmm. which is good eyesight, and you're buying what you don't really need because you feel it's going to improve your life. And so you see how you have sometimes things mixed up. 
messed up. Thank you. Let's go from there. We're going to talk about Save More. And there's a, uh, an elder of mine, actually, uh, he married us, or he was my best man at 89 years young, um, Jack Burden. And he was a Course in Miracles guy. And one of the last things he did before he uh, transitioned to the other side, just before age 93, is he sent my wife and I the book, The Richest Man in Babylon. Mm-hmm. And so I'm curious to, yeah, and thank you, Jack. Untouchable account, touchable account, and automating some savings. What can you tell us? With The Richest Man in Babylon, it's an amazing book. And after my book, I suggest everyone <laughs> read that. And it was interesting because it's written by the man named Jack Clausen, mm-hmm. who wrote the he he wrote the um, the atlas. He he's the one who created the road the atlas, and his whole thing is wealth doesn't come from what you earn, mm-hmm. it comes from what you keep, and we all so many of us say, well, I can't do that. No, you don't need a lot of money to create wealth. Wealth comes from what you save. So it's really important to, to have to save. And I like to have two savings accounts. One is a untouchable yeah. and untouchable. You, and, and you don't need a lot of money to create, to start saving. Just little small amounts consistently saved can add up to a lot. So I have an emergency fund. Mm-hmm. A non-touchable, which is only for an emergencies, and a shoe sale is not an emergency, which is why you want a touchable fund for when you want to have fun and when you want to buy something that's not an emergency. Like and it. the yep, best way to save, go, no, I'm taking, because you asked me the question, yep. is to automate, to have a little bit of money, even if it's 5 or $10 a month, automatically transferred from your checking account, your payroll check, to a savings account. And what I love about this, and I, I love thinking of, of uh, John Martini from The Secret, and, and we've had him on multiple times talking about how he went from starving and almost poisoning himself to death with pine nuts on a Hawaii beach to he lives with billionaires on a billionaire yacht now at this point, and he's close to a billionaire himself. And what he did is he started taking 10% away and then more and then more, and then more, and the funniest thing happened, which is the more that he took away, automated, of course, the more that showed up. Mm. It, yes, and you don't even need to start with 10%. You can start with whatever you can, 1%. But the important thing is to start and to put it away. And I believe... What, when you put it away, you create space for more to come. Thank you. Speaking of space, let's talk about then invest wisely. And to, the coolest thing, there's so many cool things in here, two types of investing. Um, there's a lot more. But the rule of 72 is something that if we don't understand, bites us in the butt. And if we do understand us, can make the, quote, meekest of us a millionaire in our lifetime. So it's why invest? Why not put all your money in cash? Because putting all your money in cash is like putting a wool sweater in a hot dryer. It's going to shrink over time. And our biggest, really, our biggest uh, risk is not that the markets are going to go up and down. It's that we will outlive our money. It will not grow as fast as inflation and taxes take it away. So at least some of your money needs to be in assets Mm -hmm. that grow faster than inflation. And that includes stocks, bonds, real estate, or commodities. So the rule of 72, brilliant. You divide, you look at how much your money is earning. Yeah. So let's say you have it in an investment. Oh, don't even put me on the spot with math. But I think you you have an investment that's earning 8%. Yeah. You divide 8 into 72. Yeah. Is that 9? Yes. It will take 9 years. Thank you. It will take 9 years. <laughs> You're doing years. great here, Barbara. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate your encouragement. But you don't have to be good at math. 
to be financially successful. Okay, that's just, Woo-hoo! I'm terrible at math. I don't have my calculator. <laughs> and it's this, and so if you put it in cash, which is earning less than 1%, mm-hmm. and you divide one into 72, it will take you 72 years to double your money. So you want to have at least some money in investment to grow faster than inflation and taxes. Thank Take you. it away. Thank you. Let's go the last one here, and then we'll jump ahead. We're going to work on all of these blocks today is giving generously. Yeah, we most of us have the giving generously part down pat, but giving generously without spending less, saving more, and investing wisely is always an act of self-sabotage because not only are you jeopardizing your own future security, but you're diminishing the impact you can make with your money. And honestly, the whole point of building wealth in my book is, yeah, it's fun to have money, but really it's what you can do with your money. It's what you can do with your money to have a better life for yourself, to help the people you love, to help causes you're passionate in. So we're going to dive into recognize, reframe, and respond differently here in a second. But before we do that, I'm curious, when you first started investing and the stock market tanked, and I know where I was that day, a lot of us do, the stock market tanked, what did you do? So the first time I invested and the first time it tanked, and the second time I invested, and the second time in tanked, I did two very different things. The first time was in 1986. And I didn't know anything about investing. Nothing. But everyone kept telling me I needed to invest. Yeah. And I was getting a divorce. And so I called a stockbroker and he put my money in in. I don't know what he put it in because every time he sent me all the stuff they send you, I just threw it away. I didn't understand. And in 1987, the market crashed big time. Huge. One of the biggest market crashes we've had ever had. And I called him up and I said, get my money. We're out where it's safe. And he said, no, Barbara, please don't. The market's going to go back up. It always does. And you're going to have capital gains tax to pay. Well, I didn't understand capital gains tax. I didn't understand anything. I wanted my money out. And I took it out. And in a very short time, the market went back up. So fast forward ten a year. Well, fast forward. Yeah, it was a, a year. I had my money invested, but this time I understood because my the first rule of investing in my book is you never put money in anything you don't understand, whether it's a stock or a bond or the market itself. Because not only do you not understand what you're buying, but you don't understand when to sell. And the a year later, the market crashed. It was the uh, it was nine. It was yeah, and I was excited. I was excited. I called my broker and I said. Please, let's buy. Because I understood it wasn't a crash. It was a sale. And I have been through nine market crashes Mm -hmm. since then. Nine. And my, I have done very, very well. The key to investing is to hold for the long term. You can't react with emotions. There is a quote you have in your book, and and uh, I, I might butcher it a little bit, but it's from Warren Buffett, which goes something to the effect of the market is designed to shift the assets, to shift the wealth from those who think short term to those who think long term. Cool. Yes. Yes. It is very, the key, you see, the market ever, it, the market is risky. But not being in the market is risky. But if you understand risk, how to minimize risk and maximize gains, it's a, it's, you can really do well. And what I learned is the three most powerful ways to minimize risk mm-hmm. and maximize gains are one is time. Yep. Any money you need in less than, say, three years should be in cash. Any money you need after three to five years should be invested. And then the other thing is diversification. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Diversify. Not only just stocks, bonds, say real estate, 
but there's different kinds of bonds. There's different the the stock the, the in stocks you could have uh, in international stocks, regional stocks, United States stocks, big cap stocks, large cap stocks. So it's really important to diversify. And the third way to minimize um, risk and maximize gain is fees. Be very very cautious about the fees you're paying. And today, in today's world, there is no reason at all to pay high fees. No reason at all. So way back when I got my MBA, way back when in the Stone Age, one of the things that I learned, because not that much was applicable, was the power of diversification. And we would take all these examples of different portfolios and what would happen over time. And the more robust, the more different things you had your hands in, then one could go down, but the other would go up, and over time, the whole ship would rise. So what we're talking about right now is we're talking about people are scared of money or scared of what they don't understand, and so they're not dipping their toes in the understanding water. You have something called the Osmosis School of Learning. What is that? Because I feel if we soak that into our skin, then the waters are a lot less scary. That's beautifully put, really put, beautifully put. Um, so this is what I did to learn. And, and I call it the osmosis school of learning because I would try to read books. I would try to read, you know, go to the classes and I just couldn't get it. I yeah. couldn't get it. So I learned it's small steps consistently taken that really lead to remarkable results. Yeah. So if you do these three steps, these three steps for three to four months, you will notice a huge difference. So every day, read something about money, even if it's just for a minute to don't try to read a whole book. Don't even try to read a whole page. Just read a few lines. Even if it's just picking up the business section of the newspaper and just perusing the headlines. I would take the section on finance of the Wall Street Journal, I would put it on the kitchen counter and I would figure by osmosis, I would pick something up. Because so much of getting smart or smarter is just recognizing you know, the, the, the jargon and, and the current trends. So every day read something about money, even if it's just for a minute or two. Every week have a conversation about money even if with someone, preferably with someone that knows more than you. I mean, I know these interviews were profound for me. And I, I realize that people really like to talk. And I think it's our secrecy and silence that keeps us stuck. So I'm not asking you just to ask someone how much they make, but ask them how they got smart. Yeah. What did they do? What mistakes did they make? What was the best advice they ever gave, got? What would the best advice for you be? Just ask them questions, have conversations. So every day read, every month, every week a talk, and every month save. Automatically have a little bit set aside from your checking account or payroll check to your savings account. Thank you. What do you do when people have such substantial wounds and traumas that all they mm -hmm. see is either the lack or let me be honest, in, in the past with you, I would say, well, I feel like this stock is going to take off or something like that. But if I didn't invest in it, and then I saw that it did took off, I would feel even worse about myself and stay even farther away from investments because I would say, you just blew it again. Yes, you would do that. And another person might say, oh, look how smart I am. I guess this would go up. Next time, I'm going to follow my intuition. Thank you. So you can see how there is different ways to react to the same thing. And the key is to look at what is at the root of that reaction. Why does one person say, I trust my intuition, and the other person says, I'm a loser? And that goes back much farther than one decision about the stock and not to invest. And that's the inquiry that is required for us, what you call the ninja, the, yes. the ninja approach, not the ninja, the Jedi approach, is really looking at what this tells us about ourselves and what we think about ourselves and our experience. Because our, 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 the, our past experience 
will determine our expectations. And there is nothing more powerful in fashioning our brain, our brain than our expectations. So, and it's fascinating because that means we can get stuck in an endless loop. So let's let's help people get out of this loop here. So we're going to go into these big steps, big broad steps that you talked about at the beginning. Recognize and how can we begin to observe without judgment? You, you use the words, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? And I, I'll, I'll give you an example. It just happened to me. When I, when I just finished my book yeah. and it was a project that I was doing. And so my team and I came up with this project that I was going to do. And the project was a challenge. Mm -hmm. I had never done a challenge. I had never participated in a challenge. Yeah. They tried to explain to me what it was. I had no idea, but I said, I would do it. And all of a sudden I started getting scared terrified, almost like paralyzed for this little challenge. It was, and so I thought I need to rewire something here. So I looked at what my thought was. I kind of looked at my fear and I went a little deeper and I saw my, the thought was, I don't have what it takes. Yeah. And this is really old and it hadn't come up in a long time. I thought, oh, I'm going to rewire this sucker. So I, I noticed I'm feeling like I don't have what it takes. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? I'm having a thought about, not I am, Thank but you. I'm having a thought about. That separated me from it and took part of the, 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 the sting out. I'm having a thought about I don't have what it takes. I know where that came from. That came from my father. That, that's wired in my brain. I'm having a thought. Isn't that interesting? So I separated myself. Now, how can I reframe that? How can I see this differently? And I started playing around. Well, I started saying, I have what it takes, mm -hmm. the opposite, but that didn't feel right. It didn't resonate. And so I started playing around. How can I reframe this? I thought, wait, I can handle this. I can handle whatever comes my way. Did I believe it? No, but I said it like I believed it. I pretended like I believed it, and I kept saying it over and over again. I can. I wrote it down on a, on a post-it note. It's right here. I can handle this. And then I responded differently. What I wanted to do was nothing. I wanted to call them off my team and say, I'm not doing it. I didn't want to write the emails. I did not want to write the script. I did not want, did not, and I did it. I, I, I wrote the emails. And it was really hard. It was really hard. And I wrote the script. It was, and then something amazing happened. I kept noticing I'm having this thought about not having what it takes. Yeah. Oh, I can handle this. Come on. I can handle this. And my responses that were very uncomfortable started getting more comfortable and it started getting easier as I consistently repeat it, which is what reprogramming is. It's simply repetition over and over and there is nothing more powerful than the words we use whether they come out of our mouth or through our head they are so powerful in shaping our brain and shaping our reality and i actually had fun i had a great time in this project a great time Woohoo! what's what's so cool to me you're most welcome. Thank you. What's so cool to me is, is when we talk about ACIM, Course in Miracles, we're talking about love over fear. And what you are doing here, in a sense, is loving yourself up. You're bringing love to this situation. You're bringing, actually, a sense of, well, isn't this cool? Isn't this interesting? Isn't this exciting? Let's see what I can learn. Let's see what I can find. And you're also, you, you didn't mention it, but one of the tools that you use is, is to place blame, which, how do you have blame and love in the same place? It actually works in this case. You're going, silly brain. You have some wound, you have some trauma, you have some reason that you don't think you're good enough and you're not capable, but I love you anyway, and I'm not my thoughts. We can do this. Oh, you put it so beautifully. Yes, because here's the thing. We have two voice. This, this is straight from the course. We have two voices in our head. Yeah. And re reframing and rewiring requires depends on which voice we listen to. Yeah. And it's the voice of the ego, which is the voice of fear, or the voice of our soul, which is the voice of love. And really all rewiring is unplugging 
from our ego, the voice of fear, mm -hmm. and plugging into the voice of love. But here's the thing. Anytime we feel it all threatened, and when I went to do this new project I hadn't done before, it felt threatening. And whenever we feel threatened, our thinking rational brain shuts down and we immediately go into fight, fight, or freeze. Fight, fight, or freeze. And if we can get back to the love, to the voice of love, it calms that fear center and it allows our rational brain to get back online. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In fact, we were talking about step one, recognize, step two, reframe, step three is respond differently. And I don't know if you have it off the top of your head. If not, I wrote it down from your book here. What's the other serenity prayer? Oh, you have to say it. I love it, but I don't know if by heart. God grant me, because it's exactly what you're talking about here. God grant me the serenity to stop beating myself up for not doing things perfectly. The courage to forgive myself because I'm working on doing better. And the wisdom to know that you already love me. And in essence, I already love me just the way I am. Yes, and I... I wrote a blog about that. Yeah. And the person who wrote it, I forget her name, bless her heart. The person who wrote it emailed me and said, thank you for sharing my poem with others. It's beautiful. I love it. Thank you. Let's go from, it, it, oh, go ahead. Yeah, you know, rewiring really is about going to love. That's all it is. It really is about going to love. Let's go to love here by talking about how we can lean into the fear. And you have something called stretching. What is that? I, I saw this when I interviewed high earners, successful women. I saw how all of them, they were very confident extremely confident and I expected them to be. And meanwhile, at this point, when I'm writing secrets of six figure women, I'm a chronic under earner. I never earn more than $5,000 a year. And so I'm hearing these women who are so confident. I'm thinking I could never do that. But as we get deeper into the interviews, they, every one struggled with fear, struggled with self doubt, almost all felt like a fraud and were afraid others were going to find out. Mm -hmm. And I thought, holy moly, that's how I feel. But the difference between them and me is they didn't let the fear or the self-doubt or feeling like a fraud stop them. They felt the fear and they did it anyway. And it's what I call the stretch. I ask under earners, when's the last time you did something you thought you couldn't do? And they go, ah. I ask high earners and they say all the time, it's a way of life. And mm -hmm. I call it the high earner slogan. If it's not illegal or immoral, I just say yes. <laughs> and, and that really is the key to success because success in anything, I don't care if it's making more money or losing more weight, it always lies just outside our comfort zone. And so it means stretching from what feels comfortable to what may seem impossible. And that, is how you grow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I like to think we're, we're at most in our lives, we're only one degree off, but perhaps it's only one foot or one inch, and if we just stretch to that piece, then particularly the piece that we say no to the most, we say no to with the most puissance, with the most power, force, energy, is exactly what we need to stretch for. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my favorite quote, which I have in my book, is from Joseph Campbell. Yes. And he says, the cave you fear to enter is where your treasure lies. And it's so funny. I have three daughters. They're in their 30s and 40s now. And they, whenever they feel stuck, whenever they can feel confused, whenever they don't know what to do, they always call me and they say, what do I do, mom? And they always know what I'm going to say. <laughs> and I always say to them, what are you most afraid to do? Mm -hmm. And they tell me. And I said, that's exactly what you need to do. And that it's on the other side of fear that our, our success and our power, we, that's where we find it. Coming from the girls, forgive me for saying this, but you rock, mom. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> they don't say that. <laughs> they don't say that. Someday. Go, oh, someday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're wearing red. You love red. What do red crayons have to do with fear? Oh, yeah, it's right there. It's sitting. When I was interviewing these, oh, thank you. When I was interviewing these six figure women, mm -hmm. and I so wanted to get over my overcoming under earning, and I saw how every one of them stretched beyond their fear. Mm -hmm. They did what they were scared to do. I wrote down on a piece of paper and a red with a red crayon, yep. do what you fear. That's how you succeed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I want to talk about a few other ways that we can tame anxiety and do what we fear. And, and, and I'm picking up, you've got seven of them here, I believe it is, but one of the real fun ones is use anger to fuel you. Yes. Yes, because what happens is like, you gave the example of having an, saying you found a stock and you thought, oh, this is going to do great but you didn't invest in it and it did great and you felt, felt like you were a loser because you didn't act on it. Underneath those, that feeling of loser is probably anger. And if you can find the anger and it's there usually when we don't do what we need to do or we don't achieve what we want to achieve, there is anger. If you can find the anger and use that energy to fuel you as opposed to stop you, it can be very powerful. Thank you. A few more tools here. This has been really, really fun, Barbara. What's the technique of recalling a risk and why is it so powerful? Because everything, we, a risk simply means acting in spite of uncertainty. Yes. And certainly investing in anything to do with financial success requires risk acting in spite of uncertainty. And one of the exercises I have people do in my retreat is look at risks they took and really dissect the risk. What did they do to get over their fear? How did it feel afterwards? And it helps you see that you have taken many risks in your life. And after every one, even if you didn't succeed at first, mm -hmm. but you kept going, it made you feel more powerful and it elevated your self-esteem. Beautiful. Let's go from there. Since we're talking about fear, we're talking about stretching, we're talking about taking risk. Early on, you said resistance is good for us. Now, going back to our Jedi training, maybe this is a Jedi weightlifter training. What's the truth about resistance? So it's not necessarily that it's good or bad. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. It is normal. Anytime you do what you're not used to doing or anytime you do something new, your brain is going to say, no, don't go there. I don't want to do that. It's a good sign because it shows that you indeed are up leveling. You indeed are growing. If you didn't have resistance, that means you're not doing anything different. But the key is not to let resistance stop you for very long. And the way to do that is not by fighting resistance, because what you resist persists, so you resist your resistance and it only gets stronger, is to really work with it, to really look like what is it telling you? What is the fear? And our brains have only one purpose. They've developed for only one reason, from the beginning of time and from the day we were born, and that's to keep us safe and make sure we survive. And the resistance is simply our primitive brain saying it's not safe. But since we're not on the tundra anymore and there are not any woolly mammoths chasing us, we need to look at what are we scared of? What really? And having that inquiry with yourself is what's going to help you get over resistance. Thank you. Thank you. Along with a lot of support. And that one's key, which means you actually have to share. You have to be open. You talk about in the book, time after time, going to a counselor, going to a coach, going to a therapist. You didn't say, well, I've got to figure this out all on my own and I've just got to buckle down and do this. And you don't necessarily need coaching. You don't necessarily need a, uh, a therapist, but you do need people you can talk to. 
you do need your your friends you do need your colleagues you do need support i think it's really critical and especially critical for women because we are so relationship oriented thank you a few few more key areas and then we'll uh, dive into a brief meditation how do you heal your inner child who's likely running the show so yeah what is not there's so many things not talked about by the financial media one of the major things that holds well, I only I work exclusively, pretty exclusively with women, and I know the what holds women back from becoming financially successful is unhealed trauma, and unhealed shame, and what happened? <laughs> I I give the example when we have unhealed trauma, mm-hmm. it's like it's like imagine you're driving a car, you're yeah. just driving a car. And in the back, you have your little your little girl, your, you as a little boy, nicely strapped in his car seat, playing, and you're, you're driving the car, and suddenly someone drives by you and shouts something very awful and mean. And you, you must have been in my back seat last week. <laughs> <laughs> so anything that is remotely similar to a past trauma will activate that little child Mm -hmm. and imagine that little child tearing off their seatbelt, jumping in the front seat, pushing you aside, taking the steering wheel and saying, I got this. Now, meanwhile, you're sitting there in shock. This little child does not know how to drive. (laughs) Feet can't reach the pedals. And that's who's driving your, your car. That who's driving your life when your trauma is activated. And so it's really important to work on healing the trauma because so so many really financially successful women have created financial turmoil in their life because it's as a distraction. They're not doing it consciously, but as a distraction so they won't have to feel the deeper pain of the unhealed trauma. Flipped on its head then if we deep dive. We do the Jedi dive here. This can be a powerful tool. That's why you talked about it at the beginning. Finances, wealth building is spiritual. This can be a very powerful tool to getting at the wounds once and for all. To me, for me, and for the people I work with, it is, it is as I said, it's not just a practical process. It's a spiritual practice and a healing journey. Because getting Taking back our power with money means healing all those unhealed wounds within us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, I'm not a big motivation guy, as in Sisyphus, keep pushing the stone uphill. I try to look for the path of flow and micro steps, one built on top of the other, with repetition. This is about brain plasticity, getting it wired in. How do we keep repeating the new patterns until it's a habit so that it's ridiculously easy? And yes, if you're listening, ridiculously easy to save and make money. Yeah, ridiculously easy, easy, but it's ridiculously hard at first. And so it's really important to force yourself. It takes tremendous effort Mm -hmm. to force yourself to be very mindful of the words you use, to be very, to get lots of support and let people know what you're doing and have them remind you. But most of all, it's being, it really depends on, there's a direct correlation with how committed and motivated you are to achieve what you want to achieve. And you force yourself to respond differently over and over and over again. If I had to use only one tool, yeah. that is to be hyper vigilant about the words that come out your mouth mm-hmm. and through your head. That you do not, that you cannot, to quote a book title, you cannot afford the luxury of a negative thought. And if you do have a negative thought, that you work on rewording that thought, shifting it to positive, because our thoughts and our words definitely sculpt our reality. 
thank you. So I've got a dovetail on another tool. This book is so chock full of tools here. An angry letter. Uh, so oftentimes we, we talked about anger earlier, how we can use it to fuel ourselves, mm -hmm. but it also acts like a cement block if it's not released. Unreleased anger keeps us stuck. And the way, one of the most powerful ways I found to release anger is to write an angry letter to the person or the event or the situation that you are angry with. To write the letter and to really let it out. To write it until you feel complete. You put it away for three days. You take it out, write again until you feel complete, and then you burn it. And you burn it ritualistically, rit rit ritualistically, and you burn it, and you say thank you, anger, because anger will thus serve us. Thank you, but I no longer need you. You are free. I am free. Thank you. I've got some African drums off to the side. There's exercises I teach in this technique as well. But I'm picturing now somebody actually going into the drums, burning their incense, chanting, dancing, burning this thing, and truly making it ceremony. And do you know how you know if it, you've actually completed, you've actually released the anger? When you can write a letter of gratitude to whatever you're angry at to when you can finally say thank you. Thank you because if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be where I am and who I am today. And that is not an easy letter, but that's when you know you have released the anger. Woohoo! So on that beautiful note, Barbara, where can people go to find Rewire for Wealth and find out more? Well, you can always go to my website, mm -hmm. Barbara hyphen Houston dash Houston H U S O N dot com and it's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and um, all the online bookstores. Fantastic. So if you didn't catch Barbara dash Houston H U S O N dot com, you can go to inspirenationshow dot com and we'll get you over to Barbara dash H U S O N dot com. Any last words of wisdom you want to share, Barbara, before we do a brief exercise or meditation? No, but you were really a fun interviewer. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed you a lot. Big hugs. It goes both ways. Big hugs. Big, big, big hugs. hugs. I Thank guess you. I don't have to give you double the interview back then. <laughs> no, you don't. No. No, you're, you're really fun. That, that to me, is, that, that I judge an interview or anything is if I have fun. And, and you are fun. Thank you, Barbara. Woohoo! All right. Would you have, I know we talked off air, you had some sort of a, an exercise, I believe it was, or something to help us clear one of these wounds. Well, it, this is an exercise because so our brain has been programmed by our past. Yeah. And this is a really interesting exercise to get in touch with what may be running your show that you don't realize. So I'm, I'll take you through it and then I'll explain it more. So this is just, this won't take long, but I want you to close your eyes and I want you to imagine that you go back to when you were young, very young, maybe three, maybe four, maybe five, maybe a little bit older. Go back to when you were really young. And I want you to come up with, answer this question. And if nothing comes up, don't worry, because it may come up while you're falling asleep tonight or taking a shower tomorrow, it doesn't matter. But what is your earliest memory of money? What is your earliest memory of money? And if something comes up, I want you to Go through it, and then I want you to freeze it at its most memorable time and freeze it like a photograph. Okay? That's it. Now come back. Were you able to get something? You know, Barbara, I just made a connection that I haven't made my whole life that really hurts and is fantastic. I never... 
I mean, I've done exercises similar to this before, but this, and I've gone back to my earliest memories, but a new one popped in. I was about five years old and I was climbing up. My parents weren't home. I was climbing up on a little Fisher Price uh, car parking lot thing for little Hot Wheels cars. And I was actually thinking about, strangely enough, at five, consciousness. And if my parents go away and I close my eyes, are they real? And am I real? What's real and what's not? And I remember that that's what I was thinking because then I slipped and I fell and hit my chin on the windowsill and knocked my first tooth out. And that night... Oh, go ahead. No, go on. That night... That night... I was told to put it under my pillow and the tooth fairy came and I got money, Barbara. And that's a really bad thing. Neither good nor bad, but it certainly uh, may have shaped part of my life because I just got rewarded. Go ahead. So that's, so in that moment, yes, that earliest memory is having the tooth come out Yep. In a painful way. Yep. And you made a decision about money. And what was that decision you made when you got money under your pillow? Was that if I get hurt, I get money on sub subconscious level. And that how has that early memory and that decision you made, how has that affected, can you see, your yes. experience? Well, I've had a lot of injuries in life, so we could go down that road, but let's go down a different road, which says, says that you have to work hard, you have to have pain, you have to suffer, you have to struggle. You have to literally get a tooth knocked out in order to have money. And those early decisions, which have nothing to do with reality, are totally irrational and have been stuffed down is what is controlling so many of us in our relationship with money. And by making it, bring it up to consciousness, you can change it. Woohoo! And I, I've done a lot of work, EFT, emotion code, my own clearing techniques to get at that, but I never got to that memory. Thank you, mm. Barbara. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get rewire for wealth, and begin increasing your wealth today and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this latest interview as much as I did. For more on how you can up-level your life, click on the links below for our mini masterclasses, for our boot camps, and for a very limited availability one-on-one -on -one coaching with me. Be sure to give this a huge thumbs up if you like this, leave your comments below, and you can check out more amazing videos here and here. Love you guys so, so much. Shine bright. Woohoo!